Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I pulled into the parking lot of the local strip mall looking for a spot to grab a quick lunch. As I drove slowly down the crowded lane, I noticed a pickup truck parked across two spots near the entrance of the cafe. What a jerk, I muttered. Parking is tight here and taking two spots just means someone else won't find a space. I kept driving and finally spotted an open spot on the far end of the lot. After a mediocre lunch, I headed back to my car. That's when I encountered the driver of the offending pickup walking toward his vehicle. He was an older guy wearing a plaid shirt and beat-up jeans. Hey, buddy, do you think you could park in just one spot next time? I said. Parking is really limited here. He scowled and spat back. I'll park however I damn well please. This is America. I put my hands up, not looking to start a fight. Sorry, man, just thought I'd mention it. As I headed to my car, I heard him grumbling to himself about disrespectful young punks. I just shook my head, amused by the overreaction. The next week, I had to run to the mall again for another errand. As I turned into the lot, I saw that same pickup truck taking up two coveted spots near the door. This time, I didn't say anything to the driver, but as I walked by, I noticed a woman standing nearby, staring daggers at the truck. She appeared to be in her 40s with short blonde hair and garish jewelry. The scowl on her face told me she was itching for a confrontation. This must be the truck owner's nemesis. Just then, the driver emerged from the cafe holding a coffee cup. He noticed the blonde woman's harsh gaze and rolled his eyes. Do we have to do this every time, Marcy? He huffed. I'm going to park however I want. Don't like it? Too damn bad. Marcy put her hands on her hips indignantly. We have rules here, Frank. You can't keep taking up two spaces just because you feel entitled to them. Frank snorted. And who's going to stop me, you? Marcy glared and pointed her finger at him. If you keep this up, I'll have your obnoxious truck towed. Frank chuckled dismissively and got into his truck. Marcy stood there fuming as he pulled away. I guessed Marcy must work for the property management company responsible for the lot, and Frank clearly enjoyed antagonizing her. This was better than reality TV. Over the next few weeks, I witnessed several more confrontations between Marcy and Frank. The threats to tow his truck escalated, but Frank stubbornly refused to stop his two-spot parking habit. One Saturday as I came out of the cafe, I saw Frank's truck parked normally for once. As I walked to my car, I spotted Marcy marching toward Frank's truck with a beefy tow truck driver in tow. She had finally made good on her threat. Just then, Frank came running out of the cafe, coffee spilling everywhere. Hey, what the hell? You can't just tow a man's vehicle. Marcy crossed her arms indignantly. You were warned multiple times. I finally had to teach you a lesson. Frank's face turned red with fury. You'll regret this, Marcy. Mark my words. I chuckled under my breath as I watched the angry man futilely shout at the tow truck driving away with his precious pickup. Maybe now he'd learn some manners. A few weeks later, I came back to the mall to pick up a gift. As I pulled into the lot, something seemed different. The parking spaces were nearly empty, and there were far fewer cars than normal. Had the obnoxious parking situation driven away customers? As I walked toward the cafe, I noticed a sign on the door. Closed until further notice. Peeking in the window, the place looked empty. Suddenly, Marcy came marching up, looking frazzled. Excuse me, do you know what's going on? Why is this place closed? I asked her. Marcy sighed deeply. The property owner passed away a few weeks ago. His son inherited the whole shopping center, but apparently wants to sell it for redevelopment, so he terminated all the leases. I gave a low whistle. Wow, that's crazy. What will you do now? She shrugged. Find a new job, I guess. The towing incident was the last straw. Frank is the new owner's cousin, and he convinced him I was unprofessional. My eyes went wide. Frank was the cousin of the new owner? This took an interesting turn. Just then, I noticed Frank's obnoxious pickup turning into the lot. He parked across two spots and strutted toward us wearing a smug grin. Well, hello there, Marcy, he sneered. A little birdie told me you're out of a job. Marcy glared at him, but held her tongue. That's what happens when you mess with me, Frank gloated. You're lucky my cousin didn't have you arrested for unlawfully towing my truck. I'd had enough of this guy's gloating. You know, Frank, maybe if you didn't act so entitled and park like a jerk, she wouldn't have towed you in the first place. Frank whirled toward me, rage flashing in his eyes. Listen, buddy, this is none of your business. I recommend you walk away if you know what's good for you. I stood my ground. Why don't you make me? Frank clenched his fists, but seemed unsure whether to back down or escalate. 
Just then, a shiny BMW pulled up, and a man in a tailored suit stepped out. He looked our way and called out, Frank, is this man bothering you? Frank turned red-faced. No, sir. We were just having a little chat. I've got it under control. The suited man glanced at me skeptically. I apologize if my cousin offended you. We don't want any trouble here. I suddenly realized this must be the new property owner, Frank's cousin. An idea started forming. It's quite all right, I replied politely. I understand this is a transitional time for your shopping center. In fact, I'd love to discuss potentially purchasing this property from you. I have significant commercial real estate investment experience. The man looked intrigued. Frank's eyes went wide with alarm. Let's exchange information and set up a meeting, the owner said. I introduced myself and handed him my card. Sounds good. I'll be in touch. He replied before heading into the management office. Frank stared at me, stunned. You better just walk away from this, buddy. We don't need your kind around here, he sputtered. I just smiled and said, Have a nice day, Frank, before getting in my car. I could tell this wasn't over. A week later, I met the owner at his office. I made an aggressive offer well above market price. He was skeptical at first, but when he saw the zeros on my proposal, his eyes lit up with dollar signs. We signed a contract that day. Of course, I hadn't mentioned that I knew Frank and had witnessed his obnoxious behavior. I waited to reveal that little surprise. On moving day, I showed up at the shopping center offices. I gathered the staff and tenants and announced the change in ownership. You should have seen Frank's eyes when I strolled in. His jaw just about hit the floor. I explained my vision to revitalize the property and encourage more responsible patrons. All eyes turned toward Frank. Oh, and one more thing, I added. Frank, you're no longer welcome here. And Marcy, I'd like to offer you your job back if you're interested. Frank jumped out of his seat toward me. Security held him back as he shouted obscenities. What a classy guy. Marcy broke into a huge grin. I accept your offer, thank you so much. As Frank was being dragged out, I looked him dead in the eye. Maybe this will teach you some manners. The rest of the staff clapped as Frank was escorted off the property for good. Finally, the parking lot bully got a taste of his own medicine, and Marcy got some justice after her unfair firing. These days, the shopping center is thriving again. My improved parking system leaves plenty of spots for everyone, and thanks to Marcy's diligent enforcement of the rules, patrons behave themselves. Every time I see orderly rows of cars in that lot, I can't help but smile. It just goes to show... Karma has a way of catching up with entitled jerks like Frank. As for me, whoops, the next one is a pro-revenge story. This opinion is awful, my boss told me. He'd been a lawyer for three years, and the firm assigned me to him for training, to show me, junior counsel, how to be a litigator. I disliked my boss for several reasons. He knew no law, and he expressed himself poorly in writing. For a litigator, that's like strikes one and two right there, and strike three was this. He had no courage. He was actually scared of going to court. I noticed this when he took me to assignment court one day, and when it was his turn to speak, his hands were shaking. He was scared, in assignment court, where all you do is set a trial date. What's wrong with what I wrote, I said. Not what I asked for, he said, turning away. But when I checked the memo he'd emailed me two weeks earlier, I saw that the opinion I wrote was exactly what he asked for. I knew what was going on. He was going to delete my dockets for writing the memo and then claim he did it himself, thus leaving me significantly short of my docketing quota for the month. I knew he would do this to me because he'd done it before. I knew my memo would end up on a partner's desk without my name on it. I knew that for a fact because the firm I worked at was one of the first in the city to have a really good internal network. We were using email for internal communications before the internet became a thing, so the firm was way ahead in terms of technology but not in terms of security, and not long after I joined the firm, I learned how to surf through the firm's hard drive and find interesting things, like evidence that my boss was plagiarizing my work. My boss was the epitome of the young downtown lawyer. His perfect shoes always gleamed, he wore bespoke suits because he came from money. Everyone just took it for granted that he was on the partner track. I, on the other hand, was well on my way to nowhere special, so maybe he thought it was okay to mess with me. If so, that was a big mistake on his part. I didn't like having my billable hours messed with. I seriously resented it because I was already being targeted as one of the juniors who doesn't dock it as much as he should, and I was getting pushback from the partner who headed our team. I told the partner what was going on, but he didn't care. It was like being back in middle school and showing up in the office with bruises on my face and the principal saying, boys will be boys, and sending me on my way. You'll just have to work harder or smarter, 
the partner said when I reported the latest nonsense my boss did to me. I couldn't work harder. I was doing the usual six days a week lawyers downtown are forced to do. But I could work smarter, and that night I thought up a plan. Christmas was coming, and I thought I'd give my boss a little present. It landed on his desk on December 24th, in the form of a memo purportedly from the partner that my boss reported to. The partner was an old guy, and not really on board with emails and computers, so he did everything old school, on paper. So when my boss came in on December 24th and saw a memo on his desk from the partner with a legal research assignment, that wasn't unusual. The memo was drafted in the usual form that the partner used, because of course I had taken great pains to make sure that it looked authentic. My boss walked over to the little cubicles where the juniors worked and gave me the same memo. Except his secretary had retyped it, so now the assignment was from him to me, instead of from the partner to my boss. The assignment was difficult, requiring me to do a deep dive into admiralty law, its relationship to the common law, combined with a constitutional division of powers question. But this is a huge assignment, I whined, and I'm going to be away. Can't you get someone else to do it? Is it really urgent? The memo I'd forged to my boss stressed how utterly urgent the situation was, but there was no way my boss could double-check with the partner because the partner left the day before on vacation. That's why I'd waited until December 24th. No can do, my boss said. This is a big deal. Just let HR know. Maybe they'll give you time and a half or something. He turned his back and walked away, thinking he had ruined my holidays. But he was mistaken. You see, I'd written a paper for a third-year course that was basically the same thing as the research assignment in the memo. So the only work I had to do was to find the old floppy disk with the draft on it, fiddle with it a bit, and voila. A very detailed and very long memo on an obscure point of admiralty law, with references starting back to Lord Coke's day. So I put the memo together and took my holidays as planned. I wasn't traveling anywhere, because I had no money, but I saw my family and stayed in town, and I made a point of dropping by the office during the holidays, sending an email or two, establishing that I was around, and docketing all my time for the huge amount of research I was allegedly doing. So the holidays ended, and I'm sitting in my shabby little cubicle with a huge stack of work to do, and my boss comes up to me in one of his bespoke suits with a gold tie pin and matching cufflinks. He was wearing a gold watch, too. He was dressed up, even for him, trying to make an impression of some kind. Where's that memo? You were supposed to have it on my desk when I got back. I'm going into a meeting at noon. Just finished it this morning, I said, handing him the lengthy memo that was still warm from the printer. My boss took the memo in his hands, felt its weight, and he smiled. Then he turned and walked away without a word. Just before lunch, I heard a commotion down the hall. It was a pretty loud commotion, as such things go. A loud expletive, and then a door was flung open. It was the partner, and he was screaming for my boss to get into his office now, right now, as in immediately. I had the pleasure of watching my boss scramble down the hall. Just what the heck is this? The partner said, standing in the doorway to his office, holding my handiwork at arm's length with his thumb and index finger, as if he were afraid that handling it would soil him. My boss mumbled something, and then the partner ushered him inside. I heard more shouting, then the sound of muffled excuses, and then more shouting from the partner. Then the door flung open again. Kaladin the 90S, get your butt in here too, the partner said and I got in there pronto. Did you write this memo? The partner said. I took it from him and looked it over. I wrote it. The cover page has been changed to remove my name, but other than that, it's mine. I spent all Christmas on it. Is there something wrong with it? The partner exploded. Is there something wrong with it? Something wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. It's completely useless. Utterly useless. I explained that I'd followed my boss's instructions to the letter and that I docketed more than a hundred hours on it. At this, the partner really went nuts, and told me to go back to my desk and fetch him the memo from my boss. I brought it to him, and when he read it, his face went red. He told me I could leave, and I hauled Bud out of there. From my little cubicle, I wasn't close enough to hear the full chewing out my boss got, but I heard the details through the grapevine over the next few days, about how the partners were seriously pissed that my boss had wasted over a hundred hours of a junior's time on a useless task that was obviously a prank. And how had my boss not realized that he was being pranked? Was he an idiot? I wasn't blamed at all, of course. I'd been working under my boss's close supervision. My boss didn't get fired, but there were some good outcomes for me. For one thing, the partner told me to send him a copy of any memos I wrote for my boss, 
and that ended him taking credit for my work. My boss also stopped deleting my dockets for my research. Plus, I got a belated Christmas bonus for having to give up my alleged vacation to write the stupid memo. I really hated working in that place. But whenever times were tough, I'd think back to the case of the forged memo, and that always brought a smile to my face. The next one is a petty revenge story. This happened about a year ago, and I no longer live in this apartment. Back in California, my wife and I rented a nice apartment. It had some new features, and the monthly rent was a bit expensive, but we felt that it was the better option we had at the time, and California is just generally expensive. My landlord was a retired old man who made his income through this apartment complex. He was nice when we first met and when we signed papers. On the first day, he told us that if we had any issues, we needed to call him first, and he would handle it because he'd rather have himself or his workers do it. In the first few weeks, we noticed the blinds were missing, and we asked for the missing pieces. He happily obliged and gave them to us. Then after a few days, we noticed the blinds were falling off, so we asked for more pieces. He then started getting rude and said that he would charge us if we asked again, so we let that go. Next, we noticed one of the electrical outlets wasn't working. We informed him about this. He got grumpy and didn't believe us. We insisted, and he sent his worker, but his worker also said the outlet worked. However, when I plugged in a lamp, it still didn't work. They never tested the outlet by plugging anything into it, but I let that go because he just rudely kept telling us it did, so I don't use that outlet. The last straw was our upstairs neighbor. She complained about our noise level, but it was over the most ridiculous things like hearing the door open or hearing the cabinets and closets open. We don't slam anything or run walk heavily. Our landlord took her side. In the end, the neighbor tried to make our living miserable by blasting music the whole day and leaving her dog alone to also bark non-stop. Our landlord still took her side and basically ignored us. We were ready to leave once our lease was up, but I wanted to do something to get back at him before we left. Cue the laundry room. There's a nearby laundry room in the apartment complex. Washer and dryer were $3.50 and $3 per load. In the first few months, I was playing around with the washer and dryer because I was figuring out how to use them. The settings changed to Spanish, and somehow I was able to bypass the payment method. So basically, I could get laundry done for free. I didn't do it because I didn't want to do that to our landlord. But after six months in, where we experienced our landlord's true attitude and treatment, there were many others that I haven't mentioned. I bypassed the laundry payment for the rest of the seven months we lived there before leaving. On average, I did three loads of clothing laundry per week. That doesn't include our bed sheets, washable shoes, plushies, I have a room's worth. That also doesn't include my friend's laundry, too. I had some friends stay over a few days. So I did more than just three loads a week. Anyway, I did all of that for seven months. I hope he lost quite a bit of money and paid more in electricity. When I left, I contemplated whether I should relay this hack to the other tenants, but I wasn't close enough to the other tenants to make sure this didn't come back to bite me. It was a good run nevertheless. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I used to work on an ambulance. My partner and I had been called to pick up an older man with severe dementia. He was non-responsive at baseline because his labs were low or something. Since he was a veteran, he needed to go to the veteran's hospital. No big deal. We go get him and head off towards the hospital. This was definitely not an emergency, but I was doing my due diligence. Is he alert? Nope. Are his vitals normal? Not really, but he's old and this is his normal according to the paperwork. Any new issues? None. And then the kicker. Is he having a stroke? Spoiler alert, no. To check this, we use the FAST acronym. Face. Is his face drooping on one side? Arms. Is he noticeably weaker on one side? Speech. Is his speech slurred? Time. If these answers are yes, then get to the hospital ASAP. This man had zero symptoms of a stroke. He also couldn't understand what I was saying to him due to the dementia. At worst, one hand twitched when I asked him to squeeze, but it was a random muscle twitch. So I call up the hospital and give my report to the triage nurse. When I mention the twitch, she suddenly cuts me off and tells me I have to divert to the nearest hospital. Then she hangs up on me. I check my GPS. They are the nearest hospital. Your wish is my command, nurse lady. When we pull in, the ER staff was a little confused. We took the patient into a room, and as the doctors and nurses ran around looking like fools, a different nurse came in and asked what was going on. I explained it was a simple non-emergency visit because the patient's lab results were low. I heard a snide voice in the background saying, that's the stroke patient I diverted. I clarified to the nurse that the patient was definitely not having a stroke. I explained my reasoning. 
I showed her the paperwork that proved this was his baseline, and she even redid the fast test to confirm. She agreed with me completely, giving a look toward a seat that was suddenly and mysteriously empty. The patient was able to get the appropriate care at the appropriate facility, and hopefully the nurse would be more likely to listen longer in the future. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.